Now that the post-war era had come and gone and the nation had resettled itself, Japan started a more steady rhythm of programming. The relative prosperity allowed more and more manga authors into the mix, which gave rise to 8-Man in 1963 and the more widely known Cyborg 009 in 1964. 8-Man would later on give rise to Robocop in the West, or so the story goes, and Cyborg 009 would factor heavily into the Skull Man and Common Rider, another set of cybernetic superheroes. But while that's all well and good, they're strictly ground-level heroes. The giant robot genre was looking to be stalled out with Tetsujin 28 Go. The year was 1966, and everyone was scrambling for the next big thing. Meanwhile, another giant critter was tearing up the movie theaters all across Japan. Originally a post-war cautionary tale about the horrors of nuclear power, Godzilla had steadily been getting movies made about his exploits for the past several years. Godzilla was, at this point, still the villain in his films, but was gradually softening up. The word was out, bigger really was better. This did not go unnoticed by Tsuburaya Productions, whose founder, Eiji Tsuburaya, was responsible for giving life to the Big G a decade and a half earlier. With his special effects expertise as a grounding, he began work on what would be known as Ultraman. While not specifically a machine, Ultraman laid the groundwork for some very important tropes that would come to define the robot genre as it's understood today. Ultraman, now called Original slash Shodai Ultraman, or Ultraman Hayata, after his original host, stood 40 meters tall and used a variety of attacks to battle monsters from beyond. His repertoire consisted mostly of pro wrestling attacks, chops and kicks, as well as several energy-based attacks that were used as a hisatsu or finishing blow. On a more story-based note, Ultraman had a huge repertoire of powers that only got used a few times, as the story demanded. The show was extremely popular, and the market now was opened for more live-action heroes to take the stage. In 1968, following on the heels of Ultraman's success, Mitsutero Yokoyama of Tetsujin 28 Go fame created another mechanical hero, this time simply called Giant Robo. This one was different from Tetsujin, sporting a much more refined design and a strangely Egyptian motif to the head. Whereas Tetsujin could be controlled by anyone who had the control device, Giant Robo would only listen to the first voice it heard recorded into its watch control, and it just so happens that Daisaku took it. Unfortunately, Big Fire, Giant Robo's nemesis organization, took about as well to thievery as it does to things like freedom and happiness. Like Tetsujin 28 Go before it, Giant Robo was shuttled over to the States with several big changes. It became known as Johnny Sako and his flying robot for starters. The series itself followed the Ultraman style of the time, the heroes stumble across another giant monster plot, and end the episode by destroying the monster of the week. Giant Robo would also reuse monsters twice over the course of the 26 episode series with altered paint schemes. This saved time and money on design, but also cost more to reshoot the special effects shots. Corny as they look now, those effects were often the most time-consuming and dangerous parts of production. Just ask Hiroshi Fujioka. Fujioka was the first actor to portray Kamen Rider, who shattered his leg during a motorcycle stunt. However, in spite of his injury, he did return to the show, though he would not be able to perform in his suit. Volumes could be written on Kamen Rider's legacy, but the most important thing for our purposes here involves one machine and a young Go Nagai. Go Nagai is something like a Stan Lee or a Jack Kirby to the anime world, responsible for or having a hand in the creation of many classic characters like Devil Man or Cutie Honey. Go Nagai started creating manga in the late 1960s, though few of them lasted terribly long. It was not until he began work on Mazinger Z that he became particularly important to our narrative. Mazinger Z was originally designed as Energer Z, and would have been controlled from a motorcycle driven into the back of the head. However, after seeing the success of Ishinomori's Kamen Rider, he redesigned it into a hovercraft, and Mazinger Z took on its familiar appellation. What makes this important to our story is that, while well, Tetsuan Atom was a fully independent robot, and Tetsujin 28 Go was controlled by remote control, Mazinger Z was controlled by a pilot from the inside, like a car or a motorcycle. So now we have all the necessary parts to the giant robot, because now the monster has a brain. As with many giant robot shows that would follow, the title machine boasted an array of weaponry to battle against, in this case, 
the ancient weapons of the Mycenaeans, commanded by Dr. Hell. That's Dr. Hell, by the way. He didn't go through that PhD program at Oxford to be called Mr. Hell. Dr. Hell and his army of technological terrors and biological monstrosities all want to conquer the world, and the only thing standing in their way is the Fortress of Steel, Mazinger Z. Dr. Hell, apparently not ascribing to the idea of overwhelming force, only sends a few robots at a time to battle Koji and the forces of the Photon Power Lab. At Koji's disposal is an arsenal that would bring an army to its knees, sporting rocket fists, some sort of hurricane force wind that turns enemies into rust, photon beams from its eyes, and its ultimate weapon, a heat ray from the chest fins known as breast fire. This heat ray was capable of melting any robot it hits into a useless heap of slag in seconds, or at least some 120 frames of animation. These weapons are voice activated, and Mazinger Z used them with great aplomb for 92 episodes. Koji and his partner slash romantic interest Sayaka Yumi are both far cries from Astro Boy and Shotaro Kaneda. While the forerunners of the genre were something of paragons of virtue, Koji was a motorcycle riding impulsive punk. Sayaka was little better, just as loud and tomboyish as her counterpart. Brash, stubborn, and perpetually squabbling and arguing with each other, they would form the backbone for a lot of the more singular heroes as the genre began to grow. It would seem that one of the requirements to pilot a giant robot was to be a hot-headed numbskull. Luckily for Koji, it's rare that he has to engage his brain to defeat the villain of the week. It was usually enough to go in with photon beams blazing. This is not to say that he's not a great fighter, but he's not exactly the brains of the operation. Go Nagai did have the good sense to realize that, even if the robot is invincible, the pilot certainly is not, and thus the final piece of the Mazinger Z puzzle came together, the iconic helmet slash battlesuit ensemble. It made Koji look like a spaceman, or even dare we say, like a certain bike riding grasshopper superhero, but it also kept him from getting killed when the robot took one too many jabs to the face. If you've watched any sort of Super Robot series in the last several decades, you know exactly what you're getting into with Mazinger Z, being the codifier for the genre. Go Guy didn't stop there, however, as you just can't keep a good robot down. Mazinger Z scored high all across the board when it was aired in Japan, which gave it the go-ahead to make a new series called Great Mazinger. Following the adventures of Tetsuya Sirugi and Jun Hono, Great Mazinger fought against the mice in the Empire, and their more animal-themed armies. Tetsuya is a more mature sort of pilot than Koji, but still has the same hot-headed tendencies underneath. Likewise, Jun is much like Sayaka, though also much more mature than either of the previous protagonists. Great Mazinger lasted another 56 episodes and was followed by UFO Grendizer. This final entrant into the Mazinger trilogy ran for 74 episodes and followed the adventures of the much more serious Duke Fried of the Planet Fleet as he escapes the saucer monsters of the Vagan Empire. Fried is a much more serious minded character than his predecessors, and Grendizer supports very similar weaponry to the Mazinger machines. Grendizer was listed as the most powerful robot in the Mazinger universe until the introduction of Mazen Kaiser in 2001, but the two have never crossed paths. And with all the reboots and spin offs around Mazinger, it's unlikely the two will ever come to canonical blows. Lucky for the rest of us, too, because whoever wins will be the toughest robot on the cinder. This would mark the end of Go Nagai's direct involvement with the Mazinger universe for a good long while. And though he went on to create Kotetsu Jig and Groiser X in the same style, they never reached the same dizzying heights as Mazinger Z and his successors did. So here they are the yardsticks by which super robots are measured Mazinger Z, Great Mazinger, and UFO Grandizer. I'd say that these aren't your grandfather's giant robots, but there's a good chance that they actually are. Around the same time as the release of Great Mazinger, another robot made its way to the forefront. It was similar to Mazinger Z, being birthed of bright colors and super science, but it sported a feature that would change the game once more. But that's a story for another episode.